So, um, anyway. Hey, Hugh. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I think the last time I saw you was at Lifetime. I think so. Okay. Lifetime fitness? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know some of your parishioners. I, we've been lifting weights together. Yeah. No, I, I love White Bear because it's so friendly. And there are a lot of places to meet and you run into people. So, you know, my husband and I have been looking for a smaller place. But the house You're good to is sit right there. I think everybody wants to live here. Do you live here? She I don't like the guy that way everywhere. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It's hard to find out right here. It is, it is really oh, hard to get house. Yeah. Just yeah. don't shut my mouth. No, I'm all. We're in North Coast in a new section. Kind of, uh, kind of behind the trail. And we yeah. like it, but our son left for college. And we and our parents aren't traveling so much anymore. And they're in California, so we had space to put everybody up. Um, so we're looking at the downsizing. But I love it. It's such a great community. So well, let, me, let me welcome yeah. um, Canon Blair Pogue. Um, Blair is on the bishop's staff. What I love about, and most of you guys were not in the 8 o'clock service, um, but what I really appreciate, appreciate about Blair is that she served as a rector at a parish, so she knows what it's like yeah. to be in a congregation. Sometimes on diocesan staff you get folks who have super great ideas but they've never been on the front lines of actually trying to be a community, and and it's different. And so Blair has, she has been not just in a neighboring uh, congregation here in uh, Minnesota, but has also served um, in Virginia as well. Anywhere else, Virginia and here? No, two just, congregations in Virginia, and then worked in a couple yeah. churches in Connecticut when okay. I was in Divinity School. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So she's been around the block, and so we're really, Super um, glad to have her here. Her official title is the canon, so that's a fancy word yeah. for, um, how would you describe a canon? Like a so what I tell, because I have a lot of friends who don't go to church, and they're like, canon, a weapon, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so I say it was originally from canon law, mm -hmm. right. and working with the bishop, you over, oversaw the law of the church. I don't um, do that, but I have a super fancy title best title I'll ever have, so I can't leave the job. Yeah. But yeah, it, it is kind of, we have a lot of words with a long history. Right? I know, I love those words. I you know, we have some great them. words, we just, what yeah. is that? And it's yeah. so fun to use those words and intimidate people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, under Crofton. Even as Episcopals. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because that's so, you know, Father Hart, right? Yes. So Blair is the canon for vitality and innovation for ECMN, and uh, so we're trying, as you know, the church is trying all sorts of new things, and so um, Blair's here to help us and other congregations to figure out stuff that we can try, and so thanks for being here. Well, thank oh, you. Can I ask one yeah. question? So is this a new position then? This is a new position. It's never existed before, which is really great. So I... Any of the Episcopal churches, it's never existed before. This is... This, this is a very new position, and as I've tried to find colleagues on other diocesan staffs, there are people who do congregational development, but very few people who are really trying to think outside the box and learn how to join up with neighbors in just the right ways where they are. And that's my passion. I looked for this job for a couple of years all over the National Church. My husband said, okay, I'm willing to move with you, it's your turn, never saw it, and then saw my dream job. Um, because who knows, I was just in a phenomenal church like this in St. Paul's, there 16 and a half years, I loved it so much. So this position, when I saw it, I just felt a call to it. Um, I talk a little bit more in my sermon about kind of what I'm doing, um, but what I'd like to, I'd actually like to start out with a spiritual practice, if you're willing, and then to debrief it, and then talk a little bit more, in a little bit more detail about some of the things that I'm doing, and then see what your questions and thoughts are. Because I know, I just think about White Bear, really one of my favorite places in the Twin Cities. When we moved, I said to my husband, did you look with a realtor in White Bear? Because that's the one place where everybody was friendly. I actually was on the street 
seriously, I was on the street with a two-year-old and he was hungry, and you know how that goes. <laughs> and I didn't know White Bear, and I just asked somebody on the street, is there somewhere we could get lunch? And this woman walked us several blocks to Keys. And That's I, not yeah, happened but, anywhere else in the Twin Cities. Uh -huh, so I thought, um, wow, I like, and I like the downtown, and again, how you bump into people. Um, I'm at the Lifetime, at the Caribou, I do Pilates at the Pilates place. So I just love the community. If you're out and about, you're really, I think you have, you have an amazing community and the way you're situated. I mean, my tennis team, our hangout is Washington Square Grill. That's where we go after all our, you've got, you've got such an amazing context here. Um, so I'm really excited for you. But if you'll just um, go with me, on this, I'd like you to, I don't know if there's anybody in this room you don't know or don't know well. Sometimes in churches that that is not the case, um, which is a good sign. But um, I'd like you to pair with someone here, and I'll pair if we're odd numbers, one, two. And I would like you to share a story of a time you felt spiritually alive. Where were you? What was happening? What was happening in your life at that point? And if you have any insight about it, what do you think God might have been trying to teach or show you at that particular time? And then if you could also tell your partner, um, where do you tend to feel God's presence most often? Is that here? in worship? Is that having coffee with a friend? Is that when you're with your family? Is that in nature? Uh, on the lake? Where do you, so again, I'm going to give you a minute for the poor introverts who want to really think about everything carefully. Um, share a story of a time, maybe there have been a couple of times, but a time when you really felt spiritually alive. What was happening in your life? You know, share share some of the details around that. What was that feeling like? And and if you're willing to go there, what might God have been wanting to show you, or what do you think? And then, where do you tend to feel God's presence most often? We'll just take a minute. Maybe you want to just close your eyes and think about a moment you felt spiritually alive. Well, thank you. Thank you for going with that. What is this strange lady going to make us do? <laughs> Oops. Um, I'm curious, what was that like for you, both sharing that story as well as listening to someone else? I don't. Did anybody not know their partner? Or not know them. Okay. Oh, good. We, we good. Know of each other, right? We good. Know each other, but we didn't okay. Know but but now he's a bigger rock star. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. I love it. Like, like I thought it was good before, but now I'm like, whoa. I love it. I love it. So, so, so your sermon better bring it up because oh, right now oh, it's pretty darn good. Oh my gosh. Okay. Wow. Well, no pressure. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> and you know I'm just giving you that. I know you are. So what? What was that like for you? Both, again, listening to someone's very intimate story at the time they felt spiritually alive as well as sharing your own. What, for me, listening to her was a uh, conviction of this is the right place for me. Mm -hmm. This this congregation, this church, this uh, Episcopal community mm. is exactly what I'm looking for and what is the right place for me at this time. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. So it's really a connection there. Good job, Tracy. I know, I wow. get a little cheery. Right. I get a little cheery right because, <laughs> because that's what I said to Tom. It's like we, um, we're, we're, and I do, I get emotional because we are so, ex oh, me, I can't speak for my husband. So I am so, because it's right now, right, it's about individualness right now. But it's like, I am so excited to be here. And the spiritualness mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. And there's so many pieces of spiritualness, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's, it's just so good. I am so happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. No, it is It is a very 
emotional thing it and is. to feel that connection and feel that you have a place. So many people mm -hmm. now feel disconnected, depressed, anxious. If I hear about another suicide of a young adult, yep. I'm gonna just, uh, it's really, there's so much going on in the wider culture and so many people are looking for a spiritual home where, where they can truly be themselves yep. and ask hard questions right. and yes. right and not feel like they have to come with their Sunday best on, mm -hmm. um, but come as you are. Mm -hmm. I got holes in my socks. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you might you might not come at your best, but you're gonna leave yes. your best. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. Because yes. you might come with the, your baggage, mm -hmm. right, with our. Yeah. But you leave knowing that you can handle things, you get a different perspective, yeah. and it's just, it's positive. Yes. And you leave being, you feel prepared to go out to the world. Yes. You know, and reflect on the sermons, reflect on, you know, the, the things that happened, you know, in the pew, not just, you know, the Eucharist, right? You, you leave feeling like, I got this. Mm -hmm. It's so true. It's almost like you're just filling up your tank yep. because I think about we're the gathered church but then during the week, we're the sent church. Yep. And if all of us, I mean, I'm human, so I can say my prayers and then I forget who and whose I am about an hour later. So I you know, have some practices I do during the day. But if each of us show up as Jesus's followers in our neighborhood, our workplaces, the places we hang out, what a difference that makes as we're just trying to love the people around us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love what you said. Others, what was that? What was that like for you? Um, to it's a very. Um, I mean, we're really sharing our souls here. What you're yeah. asking, so it's a very yeah. intimate thing to do with with a stranger. Yep. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. um, but um, but a really good experience from my standpoint. And uh, um, um, yeah, so that's. I mean, if we did that as a. As a church, once a year, even or just like every every week, pair with somebody else and talk about talk about that. Boy, you'd have a tight knit community and, and a group of friends. And we usually don't tell these stories to each other. In our, we haven't done that in all, in our faith communities. Yeah. In fact, what I'm going to tell you about in a minute, this faithful innovation process. I just had five teens from five congregations finish, and the most amazing things happened, very simple but powerful, through doing things like sharing their spiritual stories, getting as many people in their congregation to do this as possible, but they grew closer as teams. They said, I really didn't know these people very well that I was sitting next to every Sunday. That's so common. That's all of our churches. And when I do this, most people are like, how do I get out of this room quickly? And then, <laughs> and then I have to cut them off. They, it's really, it is vulnerable, but it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Pew Research did this study and they found out that most people in our churches have never, if they have had an experience of God's presence um, they've never shared it with anybody else and not with their pastor or priest, which is interesting. And I think they're afraid, you know, people think I'm nuts if I shared this story with them, but, but many people have had this powerful experience. Maybe it's even hard to put it into words, but of God's presence and love. Um, but it's important for us to share these stories because they are encouraging and, and, and important. Others, any, anything else? What was that like for you? I think similar to what you know Hugh mentioned. Um, I hadn't met Rona before, seen her in church a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're relatively new here, as my wife <laughs> mentioned there. Uh, but uh, you know, I shared my story, she shared hers, and it's like you find that connection, and also it helps to maybe reaffirm the way that you feel. Yeah. Right. I mean. We, we've had common type things go on. So uh, just great, I mean, helping to develop. And now I have somebody new at church that I can go to and say hi, right? So yeah. it's cool. Yeah. I feel the same way, like, you know, yeah. connecting with art, just about nature and kind of God is love. And that's where I feel, you know, and just kind of in, in, out in the world. 
mm. nature. So it's fun to share that. Kind of Poor Matt, he gets stuck with the poop. <laughs> 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 well, I, I mean, you know, we already knew that we kind of enjoyed yeah. the outdoors and everything. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Being, uh, Share your deepest yeah. spiritual experience yeah. with, with your priest. <laughs> yeah, with your priest. Was it confession? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. All the confessions right. today. No. I know. Yeah. But no, from my perspective, though, is, you know, as a clergy person, I'm just a human, I'm just a person, too, yeah. Yeah. doing the best, of, you know, with my life. I thought about that. We, we did a um, book study recently at my house, and I think one of the most positive things for me with the book study, I mean, it's good conversation, but it's for us just to connect and at a deeper level than just the superficial sometimes yeah. stuff that we do. Yeah. And, um, I don't know that, and for folks to know that we're kind of on this journey together. That's it's not like Blair and I or or leaders in the church have our, our acts together. It's we're just part of the community. Absolutely. So, anyway, and I think the storytelling, and you think about all the themes in scripture, just the storytelling you can do. Mm -hmm. Share a story of a time you were lost and then found. Mm -hmm. Share a story of a last supper. We did that, and I remembered my last supper with my grandma, mm -hmm. who was blind and deaf, and when they came with the leftovers, she thought it was candy, and she put her hand in, and then she just started laughing wow. at herself. Wow. It was just such a sweet memory of that last supper. So uh -huh. it's, everybody has so many amazing stories that they're carrying with them, and how to connect our story <coughs> with the story of God and God's people, that larger story. We're part of a larger story, which I think with a lot of the depression and the anxiety and suicide, I think people don't feel that they are part of a larger story, they feel very much alone. Um, so what you did is part of something called the Faithful Innovation Process. I've been introducing it around the diocese one of the best parts that, well, there are two things I love. I love seeing the teams just grow really close together. Um, and the neatest thing is several congregations do it together. So in the Southern process, it just ended yesterday. We had five congregations from Southern Minnesota and the Metro. And clergy have this benefit of we get together. We, we know each other. We can swap ideas. And a lot of our lay leaders don't have that. We're working on it. But it was fun to see all these lay leaders from different churches sharing ideas, riffing off each other. They all did presentations yesterday about what they did and what they learned through things that didn't work as well as things that do. And we're, we norm failure as a way to learn. And churches can feel very af afraid and ashamed of failure. But that's how we learn is we just we try stuff. We throw spaghetti at the wall. So in this process, um, and I just want you to know about it. I'm not, I know in the past, sometimes diocesan staff came and tried to pressure people to come into their programs. I'm not doing that at all. I just, I want you to know about it. And if there's interest, wonderful. But I just want you to know what's going on because I think communications are tough. I don't think a lot of people get the diocesan e-newsletter and very few people go to conventions. So. We're just doing all this stuff, but I don't think a lot of people know about it. Um, but anyway, it's a nine or 10 month process. Each church that's been participating sends a team of at least three lay leaders. It is a lay led process. The clergy's role is spiritual director and many of the clergy don't come. They'll usually come at the end to see their team's presentation, but the team stays in touch with their clergy so the clergy can help them get as much visibility in the congregation as possible. And so the team, their, their job, they go through this training. They have three in-person trainings over a nine to 10 month period. In the first one, you learn and you try three spiritual practices, including what we just did. And we're debriefing them. There's a neighborhood walk with, you're going with a posture of curiosity, wondering who's there, who's not there, what do we notice? It's unbelievable what congregations have noticed that they've never they never seen before because, and I'm in the same boat until COVID, I have to admit, remember College Park? 
I had never been to the other side of the park. Is that embarrassing? I've been at that church 15 years, but I was so busy answering email or running in and out of church. And we got over to the other side of the park, and because we were worshiping in the park during COVID, we met all these cool neighbors, and they actually could check us out in a safe way. It feels pretty scary to go into a church, mm -hmm. but they some people thought we were a music concert. Other people, <laughs> they'd come and they'd listen to the sermons because they had heard so much kind of hateful stuff about Christians in the news. They, we, we don't seem to get the good stories featured. And people came and joined us. I remember there was this guy, he was like Fu Radley, he was hiding behind a tree in College Park. And during Eucharist, I went up and I said, like, would you like bread? And he goes, yeah. And he took the bread and then he hid behind the tree again. But he came out to, it was safer in that space and kids could run around, you could bring your dog. But we started to really get to know the neighbors in a way that you know is just hard when you're in a building. So we're getting people out in the neighborhood. Um, and then we're also doing dwelling in scripture. I don't know if you do that here, but it is just, just approaching scripture imaginatively. What captures your imagination versus what's the right answer? Um, and in my last church, that we had a lot of PhDs and people would come up and whisper, my kid is asking me all kinds of questions and I don't know anything about the Bible and I'm the only one here. And I'd say, no, you're not alone. <laughs> but it's a great way to get into the biblical stories imaginatively. And again, those stories, we not only read scripture, it ends up reading us when we dwell. So the team comes back, gets as many people in the congregation engaged in these practices as possible and listens deeply. You're listening you're listening for, to what God might have to say to you through scripture. You're listening to what you see and notice and hear on those neighborhood walks. And you're listening to themes that you keep hearing in these spiritual stories. Like, it seems like in this process, 99.9% .9 of the people really meet God in nature. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, let's, so it's about living as followers of Jesus with a posture of curiosity and wondering what might God be up to in the lives of our neighbors. After three months of getting everybody possible doing these practices, the team designed small, low-cost experiments to try to learn more about what the Holy Spirit might be up to in the lives of neighbors. And it's just unbelievable what, it, I mean, Christchurch Winbury they learned, they listened to people, and they heard how lonely all the people they listened to felt in Woodbury. There aren't a lot of gathering spaces. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of new people moving into Woodbury. It's very disconnected. So they decided to have game night at a local brewery. 25 people came out, including there were people not from the church. The brewery was happy to host them, and they said, could you come back? Mm -hmm. Could you do this? People keep calling Christchurch Woodbury, saying, when's the next game night? So they went into a neutral third space to try to meet their neighbors and try to get to know them. Um, and, and it's just been very, people want more of that. They also, they kept saying, why aren't people coming to us? What they kept doing stuff to get people to come, and nobody was coming. And then they noticed that in their parking lot, they kept seeing sled tracks. And there's a hill in their parking lot. And they discovered that a corner of their parking lot is actually People's Hill to sled on. It's their sledding hill. And so they went out, so simple, they built a bonfire and they had s'mores and hot cocoa. And they met all these neighbors because they just went where their neighbors were. They just got out of the church and they met this so many cool things happened, but they met this guy named Aiden, who's 16, and he, there were connections. And Aiden started coming to the 8 a.m. service. They're like, wow, a teenager coming to the 8 a.m. service. But he, Aiden keeps coming back. Like all the people got to know him at the service and were like, hey, Aiden. And like, just because they went and they made all kinds of connections. They're gonna start a walking group in the neighborhood. Um, and then the teams come back after three months of experimenting, and we say small, low cost. If you have t-shirts and a sign out front, the stakes get higher. That's asking for a big fail. Do, we need to keep learning. The world keeps changing. 
And then people come back and you, they get up front and they kind of reflect on what they did and what they learned from what worked and what didn't. And I saw all the lay leaders scribbling notes as the teams were, just the coolest things happened. Yeah. So anyway, it's just a neat way in community to be, to continue to be learners. Because the word, word disciple means learner. We're learners following Jesus. We have to keep learning how to join up with neighbors in life-giving ways. Uh, I think people are hungering for what you described, that community, that connection. We all want to know and be known. But anyway, I wanted you to know about that. The other thing, if you're an innovator, I'm looking for lay leaders. I mean, you're doing the coolest stuff, and I don't want to steal your thunder about this paddling no group, but that's exactly what our churches need to be doing, like getting out, joining up, um, and that's what these teams are learning to do. And it's very energizing for them, and they're just completely shocked when their neighbors want to play games at the brewery or, you know, Christchurch Wedding had a fire pit at the holiday stroll. All these people came over and filled out prayer flags and wanted to talk to them. And even some people asked for prayers. They were just shocked. Um, but really, really great things have come out. Um, so anyway, I just wanted you to know about this. And I don't know if you have questions. Um, and if you're ever interested, let me know. Again, no, no pressure whatsoever. It is a commitment. It's a doable commitment. But I really, I really only want people there who really want to do it. And because when people work the process, it works. It's so incredibly simple. It's so incredibly simple. Listen, act, share. But our churches are facing some pretty uh, fierce cultural headwinds right now. And we're facing a lot of challenges that are adaptive challenges. They don't have easy, quick fix answers. And so we need to keep trying stuff like you're doing and learning and not being afraid of something not working. But again, small experiments are just really good. Yeah, what if we do coffee hour outside? What if we, you know, this paddling thing, brilliant. Um, and with fresh expressions, I'm gonna try, I have a ton of friends from the White Bear Lifetime, I play tennis there, who are ex-Catholics, who don't go to church. They believe in God, but, so uh, Father Art knows, I'm gonna start something called Plank and Pray. And I'm partnering with a therapist, a lot of her clientele, are Christians who've just been shamed or burned by churches. And so I, uh, I love exercise and I love God. And so I've been listening to all, I'm looking for Christian music with good theology. I've been listening to gospel. I've even got a song with KB, this Christian rapper, Rapping Oceans. I'm gonna just have everything on that playlist. And we're gonna just do exercises and pray. And at the end, when people are on their mats, my partner and I are just gonna share a Jesus story. Like we're telling a story and give people a minute on their mat to think about a wondering question. Like, who are you in this story? Or, you know, how might God be speaking to you through this story? And, and then we're gonna just see what the Holy Spirit does. Do people, we're gonna call it an experiment so no one feels like they're hurting my feelings if they don't wanna come back the next time. <laughs> and we're gonna see if there's any, and, and I think with a lot of the fresh expressions, when I'm training people, and I've got a lady who's starting a ukulele group in St. Paul, I've got a guy doing a young guy doing a pub church. He left John Piper's church, Bethlehem Baptist. He's like, I don't have any issues with gay clergy. I don't have any issues with women priests. He started asking questions and he got shut down. And he's got a pub church where he's meeting all these young people are leaving more conservative churches because they want to ask questions and grapple and they care and the leadership's issues are not their issues, but they're looking for a place. I think the Episcopal Church would be a great home, but we have to be for something. I, I go to a lot of churches, Episcopal churches, and I hear, I don't hear this, this is not St. John's, but I hear what we're not. I don't wanna be part of what we're not. I wanna be part of what you're for. And these young people, they, are, they, they love Jesus, and they want to use their minds and they want to serve 
And if you're about the, there, you will be packed. Like these young the people are leaving these more conservative churches in droves, um, but you have to be for something. And when there's creativity and joy and energy, you pick up on that when you walk into a church. You may not call it the Holy Spirit, but you, you can feel it. So anyway, I'm just trying to get people to try out of the box experiments, to join up with neighbors in love in appropriate ways. And, and appropriate, we don't have to push anything it's trusting that the Holy Spirit is already at work in people's lives, and we just have to join up with them. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what questions or thoughts you have. Are we just four minutes? Thank you. What you can keep going yeah. afterwards. It's just this I will stop. I have spoken, and I'm clearly a preacher, right? <laughs> can't shut her up. Can't shut her up. But I wonder if you have questions or thoughts. I'm going to Google you as soon as church is <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Just so you know. Please do. To find out more. I mean, I don't have any yeah. questions right now because. Yeah. I just got a goop. It sounds fabulous. I did have questions about yeah. the plank and pray. Yeah. I'd like to go. <laughs> I, you know, I want to, I need to talk to Father Art. I'd yeah. like to do it in your parish hall. Oh, if, yeah. Do you want to do it I, in the hall or in here? I think I'm going to have a lot of people. Yeah, this yeah, you is mats. Too small. I, I have a, if they're going to have to bring a mat, but I, I love exercise. I mean, almost and, everybody yeah. has a yoga mat. Almost everybody has a yoga mat, and I think, haven't used it <laughs> I think I'll buy a few extras yeah. so we have them. But um, the one thing is, I need a free space. So I was going to ask Father Art, I was going to look at the library. Um, I don't want to charge anything. I want people to just well, come. Well, tell me when it is, because okay, I want to come. Okay, I will. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. Mm -hmm. Once you, like, don't you, I, I think we do in Episcopal worship, it is embodied, but I think when I exercise, I just start to really feel alive, and I feel good, and in community, when I do Pilates over here, it's just really fun, and um, I just want to try it out. And I think, and I'd like to do it on Sunday.